So again, on the surface here, we're exploring how to sell tickets. Um, but I think the real magic of this workshop is just, again, showcasing how perks work together to solve real world use cases, uh, client requirements, you know, you name it. This is also the goal is to kind of surface a ton of functionality that's already available to you that you just might not be aware of. Uh, that's a problem that we have a lot with gravity perks because there's just so much functionality there. How could anyone keep track of it all? So that's again, one of the goals of these workshops in general. And I think this one is going to be particularly adept at that, uh, cause we're going to cover a lot of different things again, all under this umbrella of selling tickets. So what perks are we going to cover? Uh, inventory, conditional pricing, auto list field and nested forms. If you're not familiar with any of those, don't worry. We're going to kind of give a brief overview of each as we go through. Uh, and again, as I said, uh, we are going to share this. Uh, it's going to be recorded and available in the next weekly newsletter. So if you have to bail for any reason, don't worry about it. Uh, just take off and we will share the recording soon. Uh, and as always, we are providing this document that I'm going through. Uh, so you could follow along if you'd like. Okay. Then let's jump in. Selling tickets. So the first thing that we want to do uh, is we want to make sure that inventory is activated and we're going to go and we're going to create a new form. So we have a new form here. I'm super zoomed in, so it may look a little different, but uh, I just wanted you to be able to actually see what I'm doing. Uh, that's been one of the feedbacks uh, that we've received a lot is that it's hard to see. So zoomed in big time let me know if it's if it's too much so right now what we want to do uh the overall view is we're going to use inventory to sell general admission tickets to an event we're going to also have a special upgrade option to show how you could have multiple inventories on the same form and then we're going to also uh implement conditional pricing to discount those tickets based on the number of tickets being ordered uh, and then lastly, for this uh, segment, we're going to explore how you can use uh, GPIs or inventories, shared inventories concept um, by creating a members only form. So a whole completely separate form uh, that they're going to share the inventory with each other. Uh, and that way you could have like, again, like a members only page uh, where you have discount pricing specific to that page. And you can tailor that form specific to uh, this idea of um, having like a, a kind of, I guess you just a tailored uh, form experience. So with that said, let's go ahead and start creating the form. We have our form here. We're going to go ahead and add a product field. And this product is going to be our tickets. And we'll give that a price of $50. This is a fancy event. And then we're also going to add an option field. And I'm going to explain the significance of using an option field here in a second. And this will be, we're going to say tables. There's going to be an option or maybe themed tables. So you can, uh, you can choose specific, uh, tables, uh, that match your theme and maybe they'll have different prices on them. So this one might be fighting Balrogs for dummies. And that's going to cost $10. A $10 extra fee. Balgros. I don't know if anyone else has the issue where you just can't let a typo go, even if it's in a, just like a demo. Uh, and then we can go, uh, the, there and, then, oh, you know what, let's just, let's make this simpler. I'm going to get too far from myself. Let's just go to space theme, uh, magic theme and science theme. And we'll give you some prices here. There we go. And then now that we have that set up, we are going to move on to actually configuring the inventory for these. So on the tickets, we're going to go to perks. We're going to go select simple. And we're going to say that, hey, this one has an inventory of 100. And then we're going to say uh, that we want to show the available inventory. And so this is going to output this inventory message here that will show them how many tickets are, are, are left. And we're gonna go ahead and save the form at this point and preview it. So you can see that we have hundred items left. And if we order, you know, let's just say five of these and submit the form. When we come back, you're gonna see that there's 95 items left. 
So that's kind of like the basic functionality. Now let's set up inventory on our theme tables. So again, this one is a separate inventory field. And we also want to show the inventory here on this one. Let's go ahead and customize the message. So this one, we're saying basically we have X available, and then we can actually change the name of the item with this special merge tag. So we're going to say seat and seats. So that way we can say how many seats are available at each table. And then in order to determine that, we're going to go up to the general settings here, and we're going to select edit choices. And you can see that we have the inventory available now that we've enabled it. And we're going to say eight, each table has eight seats. Awesome. Let's go ahead and save the form. So you can see that we still have our 95 tickets available total. And of our upgrades available, uh, the, the theme tables, we have this one's already been reduced. Oh, I forgot the, uh, forgot a parentheses on that. I think that's worth fixing because it's, it looks broken without it. Let's refresh that one more time. There we go. So space theme, three seats available. Now, if you remember, this field was selected when we just submit our first test entry. So that's why you'll see that this has already been reduced um, by the previous five, that five tickets that we've ordered. And you'll also notice, interestingly, that these are sharing the same quantity. And that was the point of using the option field. Because in Gravity Forms, option fields, and you can see here, if we go up to the general tab here, you can see that it says product field mapping here. And by default, since we only had one product on the form, it automatically maps to that product. So that means that this option is specific to this product. And that means by default, it will share the same quantity. Uh, and that's like a very powerful connection there that allows uh, GP inventory to, again, deduct the correct quantity from this without you having to try to do something fancy where you're using copycat to copy the quantity here into another quantity build or anything like that. So now let's see what this looks like if we exhaust it. So let's go ahead and order, let's try to order five more and we'll keep this space theme seat available. And you can see that it says, hey, you requested five of this item, but only three are left. And we say, okay, no problem. We will just take the rest of those three seats there. Then it goes through. And when we look at the form again, you'll see that that option has zero seats available, so it's disabled. Now, if we wanted uh, to prevent that, just hide that option completely. We don't want people to feel left out that they didn't get the space theme people table, then you can say hide choice when inventory exhausted. And if we save the form and go back, you'll see that now that table, uh, that option doesn't even show up at all. So now let's say that we only want to uh, allow people to select a certain number of seats, right? So for example, let's say that we don't want them to be able to order 12 seats here because there will never be a table that could fit all 12 of them. Uh, and maybe that's just a, a limit that you have on that. So how would you do that? So there's two ways. One, you can use a dropdown field. Uh, just, I won't save this, but I'll just show you how you could add, oh, we actually want a quantity field. So you could add a separate quantity field and you could go into the choices. Oh, we gotta actually select a field type first. So we can make this a uh, dropdown quantity field and then we could just add it. So you can already see here, like one, two, three, and then you just add as many uh, options there as you want. So if we wanted to cap it at eight, you would just add up to eight choices there. And they could just select it that way. In this case, I think that the quantity field still just provides like a better UI for our demo here. So we want to keep that, but we want to limit this quantity input to a specific pack, a, a specific max. And that actually uh, is available with our rounding plugin. So you can just download the plugin and install it. In my case, I'm actually going to use uh, my functions file because I already have all of our snippets running locally. So I'm going to include that. And by default, it just, it just runs. And now I can actually go to my form and I could go down to the appearance and to activate this functionality, I can say GW round max, and we're going to go eight. And we're going to save the form. So now when we go here, you're going to see, we know that 12 again, it automatically gets reduced to eight which matches how many uh, seats are available on the table. So essentially you're saying, hey, the most tickets you can get is a table's worth of tickets. Awesome. So now 
Let's talk about the, oh, we actually already jumped ahead and did that. <laughs> we're, we're cruising now. So yeah, we've already done the upgrade inventory um, where we showed how each table could be assigned its own inventory. That inventory uh, is separate from the tickets, the total tickets inventory, uh, but also limited by the same quantity field. So now we're gonna move on to conditional pricing and show how to actually discount these tickets if they order uh, a certain amount. So we'll say, let's say they wanna, if they order more than four, we're gonna give them a dollar off per ticket. So let's refresh this page and let's go to conditional pricing. And we're gonna select our tickets product. And by default, we already know that the price is $50. So we're gonna set this price to $40 if the ticket's quantity is greater than three. Gravity Forms doesn't support greater than or equal in conditional logic. I think it's something they'll probably add when they uh, redo conditional logic. But for now, you just it's easy to work around by saying just greater than and then just setting your number, your greater than or equal to number to one less. Uh, so greater than three is gonna be four or more. We're gonna say done. We're gonna save conditional pricing. And you know what? Let's just add one more here. Let's say that if they have more than, if they have six or more, we'll, we'll take another dollar off. Now, one trick here is uh, conditional pricing is a first match um, rule matcher. So that means that you want to have the, the strictest requirement first. So in this case, the stricter requirement is gonna be the five. Um, and then that, that way they, if they select three, so just a, I'm trying to think about the best way to explain this. If they select three here, then this would be the first match. So any number greater than three would be the first match, even though you have this other rule here that, hey, if it's greater than five, it would be this. So then they would always get the 49 pricing and this price would never apply. So by doing this, you can see that that's like the, the greater restriction there. They have to order the higher number. And so therefore, if we put that one first and that matches, or if it doesn't match, then I'll move on to this one. Let's go ahead and save that. And let's go to our form now. So now we're just gonna go up. Again, now on this next one, we're gonna go to four. You can see that the price goes down to 49. And we go up one, two more, it's gone down to 48. And also I just realized it's probably a good idea to add a total field to this form. So you can actually see how Gravity Forms is kind of calculating these totals there. So there we go. So now we add one, you can see that it's $50 plus our uh, 10, was it $20? Yeah, $20 for the magic theme table for a total of 70. And you'll see that it it basically just increases every one because this applies for each of those quantities and this applies for each of those quantities. And you can also see how the total is adjusted by the discounted price. And if you keep going up, it'll keep showing you. But again, as soon as you leave the field, then it matches it back out to eight. Uh, and reduces everything else. Cool. All right, so let's take it a little further. Let's do the shared inventory with the, the members only field, our members only form. So we're gonna go back to our forms menu here. And this is the form that we just used. We're gonna go ahead and duplicate it. So, and then we'll go to settings. We're gonna give this a different name. So we know that it's a different form. We're gonna say this is our members only form. I'll we'll save this, we'll go to edit. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna say, hey, there's no discounts on this one. So go to the, we're gonna go to our conditional pricing. So if we just duplicate this, we're gonna delete these rules. We're gonna save conditional pricing. We're gonna go back to edit this form. And we're gonna say, hey, our members get these tickets for 40 bucks rather than that. Now just to be clear, you could technically handle this all in the same form using conditional pricing, for example. Um, you could populate their role or however you're identifying that they're a member. Maybe you have a list of email addresses um, that are member email addresses. Number of ways, number of ways to tackle this. I just know that sometimes when you are doing like a tailored approach, it can get really annoying to try to bake all of that conditional logic into a single form. And sometimes the best option is just to duplicate the form so you can create that tailored experience there. And again, the cool thing here is that we're going to be able to share the inventory across both forms. So let's go down to the perks here. So this was previously using simple. Now we're going to have to update this to advanced. So with this, we're going to go ahead and add a new resource. 
and we're going to call this uh, tickets. And we'll say, let's say workshop tickets. There we go. And we're going to set the inventory to 100 as we had. And we're going to, we're not going to do any scopes. Um, scopes are pretty awesome. It allows you to do things like make the event date specific or time specific. Um, but we're not going to cover that on this one. So now that we've set that up, that's it. We're going to go do the same thing on our upgrade field. Again, this is a separate inventory. So we're going to say this is uh, workshop tables. Workshop table seats is technically what we're uh, what we're actually making an inventory there. And again, this one is still set on the actual choices. So that is done. And we're going to go up to our choices and make sure that those still have our inventory perfect. And now we need to save this form and we're going to go to our other form, our form. What was the one before this? Uh oh, oh, this page is, uh, was open before there's our form form 965 and we'll go ahead just for the, the sake of, so we don't confuse ourselves. We're going to say this is a uh, general public, uh, tickets. And we'll say that this, this way, when we preview this, uh, we'll know, <laughs> we'll know which form is which. So now that we have that set up, we need to go and map. This is our general public tickets. So again, this was previously configured to use the simple inventory. We need to update this to use our advanced inventory. So you can see all of these previous ones. We're going to go ahead down here and select the tickets or workshop tickets. Excuse me. That's the one we just set up. And you can see, you can actually edit it from either form. In this case, we don't need to edit it because it's already just perfect. And we're going to go down to our theme to tables resource. We're going to scroll down to our choice based inventories here, and we're going to get the workshop table seats. Awesome. And we're going to save this form. And now if we preview this form, you can see all that inventory is being applied. And if we go and preview this form, you'll see that the same inventory is being applied here. So let's order a couple more tickets just to see this in action. So you can see that magic, uh, magic theme table now only has six seats available and 90 tickets available on our members only form. And again, because they're sharing the same inventory pool, you'll see that the general public tickets have now gone down to 90 tickets as well. And the magic theme table has only six seats available. Pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, I was actually <laughs> really, we brainstormed that one for a long time trying to figure out the best way to solve that problem. Uh, previously we had a snippet when this was part of limit choices and the snippet was pretty, uh, pretty complex and trying to figure out a UI for that was pretty complicated, but we think that works pretty well. Uh, obviously we're always looking for feedback though. So let us know a couple other things you can do, uh, to take this a little further. Uh, I'm not going to demo these right now, but unique ID and QR code. So in this case, we're ordering multiple tickets. How do you create unique IDs or ticket IDs for those, uh, and QR code. So for the ticket IDs, uh, we actually have a awesome snippet, um, and unique ID. And we're actually writing an article about this right now. So I'm looking forward to sharing that's called multiple IDs. And it will let you essentially take a unique ID field as the choice. So you can configure what you want your IDs to look like and to how to function. Uh, and then it will actually populate them as uh, their own lines, like a text area field. And you can make that text area field, uh, an administrative field. So you can interact with it on the back end, um, but not show it on the front end. Um, and then from there, we're working on a snippet, uh, to use uh, GPQR code to then take that text area field and be able to generate a unique QR code for each of the IDs in that field, um, based on just each new line could have its own value. Uh, beyond that, um, I think the next way to take this further is to improve the collection experience for the attendee information. Um, so we have this form that's collecting for selling tickets, but now we want to get some information about the attendees. And that will lead us into our next segment, uh, auto list build and nested forms. Now, before we go into that segment, um, do we have any good questions that are kind of specific to the selling the tickets portion of this? Um, I think you're good to go. Fantastic. Maybe just wait, uh, a minute here to see if any come in, but otherwise if I don't come back and say 30 seconds, you're good to go. 
Dude, all good. I'll just keep moving and uh, we'll catch them at the end. Uh, if you want to just add them to the Q&A doc, that would be awesome. Or just your, however you want to manage it. Cool. Okay. Collecting attendee info. So again, let's go back to our form here. We will continue working with our general public tickets form. So they can order up to eight tickets. That means that there's up to eight people that they're going to be registering for this event. How do you collect um, that data? Um, probably, you know, the base version of this, we probably want to get their name and an email address so you can, you know, market to them um, or just include them on your mailing list or possibly even register them. Um, so the, the low tech version of this is the list field. The list field is just a great, simple tool for collecting repeating information. So we'll have a list field here. We'll go up to general and we'll enable multiple columns and then we'll give each column its own name. So we'll say, you know, like first name, last name, uh, and then email. We'll save that. Now, obviously the, the big limiter right now, you probably might have already thought about is okay. Like, but they've ordered eight tickets. How do we ensure that they are entering eight attendees in that list field? So there's a couple ways. Uh, for the list field specifically, I recommend auto list field. So auto list field, you just enable it, shows up on the perks tab, you click enable auto list field, and then you can select a trigger field. And what that says is basically like, hey, however many tickets, uh, whatever the quantity is here, we wanna add that many rows here. And it also prevents them from rem removing rows. So now we've saved that. We can look here. You'll see that we have zero there. It always has at least one row. And actually, let me also name this just for clarity here. So let's go ahead and start adding quantities to this. So you can see that it'll just keep adding. And then you go in and just enter the information. few limitations with the list field, obviously, um, it's kind of free form in the sense that you're, this is not going to validate that this is a valid email address. Um, it by default, it doesn't even validate that they're not empty. So you could, we could just submit this form. No problem right now. Let's do it. Let's, let's do two though. Oh, well, we'll fix that. But as you can see though, it still let us submit it. And if we, again, we could put an invalid email in here. Submit that. And it goes right through, no problem. So to solve the required, uh, we actually have a pretty awesome resource for that. Um, it lets you tell it which columns are required. So you can have optional or required columns or just require all columns. So anytime you have a list field, you can set it up to say, hey, anytime there's a list field, like, and the list field itself is required, that means that all columns of the list field are required. I think by default, Gravity Forms only requires the first, just at least one input, and it has anything filled out, um, then it will, uh, it will pass validation. As far as changing the actual field types, there are some filters for this. If that's something that you're interested in exploring, um, let us know and I could, I could definitely demo some of that. Uh, but for now, again, I think the list field is, is a great like low tech solution. If you're not doing anything mission critical, I would definitely use it. Uh, we use it on, on a variety of things internally as well. But if you're looking for something a little bit more robust, there is the repeater API that is provided by gravity forms. Um, it's all code based, um, man, you have to like register the field and, and do all that. And I think that's a perfectly viable solution. Uh, but for now, I'm going to actually demo our solution for this, which is nested forms. So with nested forms, we'll go in and delete this field. And we're going to add a nested form field. So I've already created a form ahead of time for our workshop. Our workshop attendee child form. And we can actually go take a quick peek at that to see what it looks like. Don't know what that's about, but like, oh, oh, I wonder if it doesn't exist somehow. 
Let me try saving this really quick and then going back. Oh, weird. Yeah, I think maybe it just didn't update that link for some reason. So this is our attendee child form here. This is where we'll enter all of the attendee information. We're just again collecting some of the same information that we're collecting on the list field. It's just, this is gonna be uh, a more controlled um, submission where again, we have the first and last name, not only in separate inputs, but in an actual name field. Um, so you can extract that data a lot more easily. Uh, the email field, we even have the ability to have them confirm their email here because we're using, again, like a full-blown email field, not just an input on a list field. Uh, and then we can even ask, uh, add additional fields here. So for example, you know, do they have any special requirements? Um, and then they could enter and end those requirements there. So that is our form. We're going to go ahead and select some fields. We're just going to say on this view, we're just going to show the name and the email. And we're going to go ahead and update the entry labels to attendee and attendees. You can see where those update right here in the oh, attend desk. Uh, right in the UI here. And we will actually name the field itself attendees. Awesome. So again, we have the same issue of we are going to have a certain number. Actually, let me just show you that really quick. So you have three here, and then again, you can go into the form and add these attendees. And that's how it will show up. Obviously, I'm super zoomed in right now, so that's wrapping. But you get the idea. Uh, just list the attendees and kind of gives you like a quick summary of their information without, you know, kind of inundating the form with everything that was submitted. That allows you to collect a ton of information kind of behind the scenes um, while still giving them the pertinent information that they really need to confirm and make sure like, okay, yeah, I signed David up, I signed Jane up, I signed Roger up, we're good. Uh, but then they can just assume that all the details of that chain are right. Because let's be honest, when you're submitting a ton of information at once, it's pretty hard to review it all anyways. So now with that said, we're going to go ahead and explore the issue that I was just talking about where right now I could just submit as many as I wanted. Uh, and of course I could set a static limit, uh, under the advanced tab you can set an entry limit here of like, Hey, they have to set at least one that's helpful. And, uh, or you can say they have to enter a maximum eight, but you don't necessarily want them to submit eight attendees if they've only ordered three tickets, because then you're like, which attendee are these tickets for and like, which is the real attendee, which one is not the real attendee just creates like a administrative nightmare there. So we have an awesome snippet for that too. For you, this is it. It's called uh, dynamic entry min max to configure it. I actually have it set up locally here. So let's go ahead and uncomment this. So again, uh, with this one, it's actually not a plugin. I don't think let me actually see. Yeah. It doesn't have a plugin header on it. So this one you would typically install as a, uh, PHP snippet, either in functional.php or, um, in whatever, whatever you're using for code on uh, your code management. Uh, a lot of, there's like a lot of great plugins out there for that. And then here's the configuration. All we got to do is to say, Hey, let's update our parent form. So this is nine, six, five, and let's get our. Uh, our field ID that is six. And in this case, the max field ID is actually going to be the same as in my original demo, because it is one and the three targets the actual quantity field. So that's what that 1.3 represents field ID input ID. So with that in place, you're going to go ahead and see that because we have zero tickets ordered, it's going to show that, Hey, maximum number of attendees reached. And again, I'm almost certain that if we submit this, yeah, it will let us know like, Hey, if they set our maximum of zero, then he's, that's a little weird, but I don't know, uh, if that's something that we'll address in the near term, but right now, uh, again, this assumes that you are going to enter some quantity. So let's go ahead and just do, let's do two to make this easy. You'll see that the limit has gone away. Um, it might be worth exploring, removing this error message just for clarity. So now we can go ahead and add, well, now if we submit it again, again, we'll just see the same, same thing. Hey, please enter our maximum two attendees or minimum of two attendees. 
uh, again, because I've configured both the min and the max to the same amount. So now we'll do chain. And we'll say that Jane has a nut allergy. And we'll add Tendi. And there you go. Max is reached. They can't submit uh, any additional child entries. And when we actually submit this form, it will go through successfully because we have met all of the requirements. All right. Um, dang. Yeah, that's it. So I know there's got to be some good questions now. <laughs> Anything related to this uh, before we jump into pre-submitted questions? Uh, it looks like Clay's actually handled all of them. Clay is such a bully. Going in there, answering all my questions. Thank you, Clay. All right, then let's uh, let's look at the the Q and A. Uh, Shake. You had asked about um, better ticket scanning. I, I briefly touched on this with the QR code. Again, right now, uh, the QR code is kind of limited in the sense that it can only generate a single QR code per field value. Um, but I believe Clay is actively working on a snippet um, that will allow you to um, generate multiple QR codes from a single field um, based on the, well, in this case, based on a line break, uh, I could definitely see extending that in the future. So for example, um, with attendees, you could generate uh, a QR code per, um, per nested entry there, but actually have it available on the parent form. Um, right now, of course, you could always do a, each, give each, send each QR code to each attendee individually, but that's kind of, you know, that's not desirable when you actually want maybe the, the actual registrar, whoever's like registering all these, all of these attendees to have full access um, to that information. Um, you might just want to send it to him and allow or him, them and let them disperse that to whoever they want. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to see if there's anything else pertinent here. The other thing you mentioned here was this idea of um, having like essentially like a one-time scan um, we actually do have a kind of work in progress solution for this. It's pretty, uh, bare bones right now, but let me set a little reminder to myself and I will send you this. And I'll swing back to this if we have time shape and I could probably pull it up and, uh, and show you, um, here on the call. Before I do that though, I want to answer some of these other questions really quick. Uh, William asked, uh, is it possible to manage inventories on a time field? So not exactly. So let's do, let's get hands on here. Let's add a new form. So what we typically recommend doing is rather than doing uh, it based on a time field like this, which again, this is what that looks like. We actually recommend doing something like a drop down. And so with the drop down, you would actually put your own choices in. Um, oops. Get rid of that. And so we go to edit choices here. So then you could just say whatever your hours are. You can say, you know, 8 a.m., 9 a.m., 10 a.m. And then those would essentially be your slots, right? And so we go down to, and actually, let's give these some names just to make it, make it clear. So then we go down to perks here and we go to advanced. Uh, well, again, if you're just doing something really simple, like just, you just want to book time slots, you could obviously do simple here and then give them, uh, the choice inventory. Oops, wrong tab. Go to edit choices. And you can say, Hey, we have like literally one slot for each of these. Right. And then of course we save the form and we preview that. And, uh, oh, let me enable the show it inventory. I just find that that is it's so helpful just to be able to see that as visual, just visualizing that inventory there. So you can see we have each of these as one item and as soon as we use it, um, it's gone it, or it's, you know, reserved, it's done. No, no other time slots available. But again, you know, you could take this even a step further though and say like, let's limit time slots per day, right? And so this is actually an awesome example where we can use the advanced inventory and we'll add time slots by day 
and we'll add a scope here. We're going to say the date is the scope. This is kind of arbitrary. You're just going to match this scope to a field. And in our case, we're going to say, hey, we want to match this date scope to our date field. So now what that says is that essentially whatever is selected here. So first of all, you'll see that our 8 a.m. is back again because it's now scoped to this date field. And let's just say, hey, on the 13th, we're going to take this 8 a.m. slot. And if we go here and we go back to, was it the 13th? You'll see that 8 a.m. is no longer available. Uh, and we could go, so that, okay, well, I, I, want, it, I want 8 a.m. on the, the this day. Select that, go back, and we'll select the 13th. And it's like, hey, sorry, that's not available. We go to the 14th, and it's like, oh, sorry, that's not available. So we go on to the 15th, and you can see that. So that's actually the power of scoping right there, where um, those time slots can be have their inventory applied per volume in another field. Hope that answers your question. Um, let me know if you have any follow-ups there. Oh, Rob, uh, yeah, bud, we're not gonna answer your first <laughs> your first question in your email. I extracted your your backup question here. Uh, what sort of setup would you recommend for a website with nearly 100 plugins, 9,000 users, and close to 200 gravity forms that relates heavily on gravity birds, gravity flow, and gravity view? in terms of maintenance and troubleshooting? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that's something, honestly, that we're still kind of exploring on our end. Um, like, there's definitely a growing number of users that kind of fit this, uh, these specs, this these metrics of usage. Uh, obviously, we're doing our best to create, um, you know, acceptance tests anytime there's a bug. As far as on your end, man, I mean, I, the one thing is a staging site. Having a staging site is huge. Um, that way you can set it up on the staging site. Unfortunately, I mean, we all know from firsthand experience that even with a staging site and even testing on the staging site, that won't necessarily turn up every issue um, that will appear. I will say one other thing that can be useful is, um, you know, again, when you're getting up into this level of usage, um, I start to get a little wary of pushing things to their very limits. Um, I know with uh, with Popular Anything, for example, we just have a ton of people doing things that we never imagined that they would do with it. And so it wasn't you know, developed with that use case in mind. And a lot of times for us, it's just an unknown unknown. So when we make a change, there are no known thing that it's breaking but there can sometimes be an unknown thing that it is breaking. Uh, and that is a, a struggle. And again, that's why we're so committed to writing acceptance tests for all the bugs that we get for it, because we want to systematically uncover all of these unknown unknowns and uh, you know make sure that they don't happen in the future. Yeah, I feel like there's, <laughs> I feel like that's just like a big question, Rob. And it's just definitely something that, you know, I think that we should probably like collaborate more on uh, solving. Definitely don't think I'm going to have like a perfect solution for you right now. But yeah, just, I guess the, to summarize the staging site and um, just kind of honoring the limits of plugins is probably a good start. Just only using things that are 100% for sure um, supported. And don't be shy about asking us if, you know, you're like, if you think that something might be on the, the edge, like you're like, hey, this is maybe not intended to work, but it does work and it solves my problem. I might reach out to us just to let us know. So then we can at least make a decision at that point. We're like, hey, yes, this is something that we think it's for it. We'll add an acceptance test for it. Um, yeah. So yeah, just collaborate with us and we'll we'll do our best. Can't speak for the other people in the community. But again, that is something that we've talked about before and I would definitely like to keep exploring. Patrick. Um, says if you're doing events uh with guest signups that require signing a waiver oh this is such a cool one i i think that we might have time let's let's try it i'm gonna add a new nested form here and i'm gonna go to the snippet library and i think that i had a, a snippet for this so the idea here that i think would just be so nice oh uh, Clay, you might also be able to find this even faster than me. It, it was a demo I showed you where it just had the add button for the nested form instead of a full blown. Oh, you know what? I don't think it's in the library. 
Dang, Patrick, I have such a good solution for this. I'm so annoyed that I didn't see your question in time because um, I really would love to show you um, how it can work. But for now, I, I will at least show you how you can hide the entries table when it's empty. Oh, you know what? I think I can just grab this here. Again, I already have it running locally. I think this is going to apply globally. So now we go to preview this form. So this is the idea here for what I was going to suggest there. Um, so this would be your waiver. Let's just say, let's call this waiver. And so with this snippet activated, you'll see that the first thing is that it hides the entries table. Well, just to be clear, that's the only, it just hides the entries table if there is, if there are no child entries submitted. So then also just to kind of like really like set, like send, send this home, like make it connect. Let's say this is a waiver and our waivers. All right, save that. And now let's go. Okay, so there you go. So waiver, so then you go add waiver. So this could be your waiver form it has all of the data that you need them to sign. Anything you need them to fill out that is specific to the waiver. You can even use the parent merge tag to copy if their names on the, the parent form, you can copy that into the waiver form and then have them sign that there. Um, and then after they added the waiver, it would show up here, right? But the snippet that I wanted to show you was one, and let me actually check the chat here to see if Clay found it. Yes. Oh, wait, is that his pull request? Oh, it's just literally in the pull request. Genius. Okay. So cool. I am going to get to show you. Get that out of my way. I'm going to paste that in. I'm going to get rid of this one so it doesn't conflict. And it looks like this will also apply globally. So fantastic. Oh, bummer. Oh, is it in this? That was merged. Hmm. Dang it. I guess I won't be able to after all. But the idea is that uh, what it does is it shows you, um, I'm going to just revert back to the uh, the original one I had because I was still close to the finished product. But... So on this view, rather than showing that you any information about it, um, like again, especially if it's just like one waiver that needs to be signed, it would just show you a checkbox or whatever you want. Like, you know, like a, a, an emoji with a little checkbox saying like, hey, you know, waiver signed. Uh, and if that's the case, um, I think that would just be a great solution uh, for what you're looking to do. And that way, again, yeah, that waiver would be a child entry on that parent. Um, so there would always be that connection between the two. Cool. All right. Well, hey, we are out of time. Any other last minute questions before we wrap this thing up? Cool. I'll wait for your word on that. We do have one, another beefy one from Rob, if you want to tackle it. It's somewhat unrelated, but I can read it out if you like. So he says, um, a site of mine was targeted for testing stolen credit cards. Credit card numbers using a high volume of low dollar transactions. After issuing tons of refunds, I added spam protection recapture. Unfortunately, I then had a problem uh, in which two legitimate transactions were marked as spam. Uh, I marked them as not spam, but I found no way to have the attempted transactions processed correctly. Does any Gravity Form spam protection option currently exist that would have allowed this, i.e. mark a false positive spam entry as not spam and then allow the purchase to be made? So he's basically asking, does any Gravity Form spam protection option currently exist that would have allowed this? And just to kind of elaborate, says, like, i.e. mark a false positive spam entry as not spam and then allow the purchase to be made thereafter. Dang, that's a good question. I don't know for sure. My instinct is that, and I don't know what payment gateway um, you're using, but my instinct is that it feels like, I know that with like Stripe, for example, I know that it authorizes the, the payment before it attempts to capture it. So, and that happens before the form is submitted. So almost certainly before the, um, 
before it would be about like evaluated as spam or not. So that authorization should happen no matter what. And my gut, and again, I can't really confirm this quickly, um, but I think that if you go into that entry, if you're using Stripe or uh, again, that would be helpful to know which one you're using, you shouldn't be able to capture the authorized transaction um, in the entry detail. And if not the entry detail, then almost certainly in Stripe, you could go to the Stripe transaction and capture that author authorized transaction there. Um, which should send the webhook back to Gravity Forms uh, and enable, you know, all the magic that happens there to, you know, um, mark the entry as paid um, and send notifications, et cetera. Hopefully that's helpful. But yeah. All right, y'all. We're already a little bit over time here. I'm going to go ahead and call it. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Uh, I'm very curious for feedback. We're going to send a form out. I'd really love to know how you guys feel about the format of this one. Again, it was like a little different. We were kind of doing like a deep dive into a, a use case. Um, or if you prefer more just like general product demos, uh, again, like we love, 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 love feedback and we're super quick to act on it. So feel motivated. Uh, your, your words will have impacts. All right, everybody. Take it easy. Thanks again for coming.